Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. We can do better than that. Good morning. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so thank you for coming. I know you have a lot of great choices and foundational sessions to go to, so I appreciate you taking the time uh, to spend the next hour with me. My name is Brian Keller, and I'm the technical evangelist for our Visual Studio application lifecycle management capabilities. So uh, I have several sessions this week. This session is designed to give you a 200-level overview of our complete ALM story within Visual Studio 2012. And of course, a big part of that is Team Foundation Server 2012. Quick show of hands, how many people are using TFS today? Fantastic. Okay, so for those of you that aren't, I'll talk about some ways that you can easily get started with Team Foundation Server. Um, just to set a disclaimer, most of what I'll be showing you does require Team Foundation Server, although there's, there's, there's plenty that I'll show you that doesn't. So if you're not yet on TFS, uh, we have lots of content this week to help you take a first look at that. So when we talk about application lifecycle management, it really extends beyond this concept that we used to talk about, which is SDLC. SDLC is really important, the software development lifecycle, but the original kind of genesis of SDLC didn't really span the entire lifecycle of your applications. So it didn't take into account starting at requirements, and it didn't necessarily take into account what you do when you're done with the software and you hand it off to operations. And so as we look at ALM and we look at how Visual Studio can grow to support you across that entire lifecycle, we kind of use this to frame the sets of areas that Microsoft is making investments to help not only you as programmers, and I realize most of you in this room are programmers, and I have a lot of stuff to show you, but also how do your teams engage with stakeholders? How do you get that input into the product? And how do you then take the integration between development and operations? And you saw Jason uh, demonstrate some of that between System Center and uh, Team Foundation Server this morning. I'll show you a couple more ways that we're really helping you to bridge that gap. And so you've seen Visual Studio evolve and grow up. I think Visual Studio is something like 15 years old now, so we're really proud of it. Pretty soon it's going to get its driver's license and go off to college and all those things. And uh, so we're meanwhile trying to make sure that Visual Studio provides you a first-class tool set, not just to write great code, uh, but to extend across that entire life cycle. So let's dive right in. If we look at some of the problems that we see across this life cycle, one of the first ones that I alluded to is as you engage with stakeholders, you want to really make sure that you understand the requirements that the stakeholders are asking for before you start investing in expensive lines of code. We have this saying, how often have you built what your customers asked for, but not what they really wanted? I'm sure that's never happened to you. Uh, occasionally, it's happened to me in the past. But that's a problem that we think that, uh, that we can really help uh, solve by making sure we focus first and foremost on listening to the customer, showing them what we think that they told us before we start investing in that expensive code uh, up front. So I'll show you a new PowerPoint storyboarding tool that we have, uh, which we think can help fill that gap. The other thing, of course, that you have to manage during this process of engaging with your stakeholders is how do you deal with conflicting priorities? How many of you out there are practicing a methodology like Scrum? Okay, great. So for you, the tools that I'm going to show you next are going to be immediately familiar when it comes to product backlogs and sprints and being able to, uh, to, to plan those and break them down and track the work across task boards. But rest assured that even if you didn't raise your hand, if you're not practicing Scrum, I'm sure there's a lot of good reasons for why some organizations, it just isn't a good fit. But these tools will still adapt for your organization. So I just want to make sure you understand uh, that you're not going to miss out just because you have a more formal or rigid process that you have to follow. And then finally, the other part of making sure that we engage with stakeholders is to ensure that once we've built something and we're ready to get their feedback again, we can get their feedback in an actionable way that allows us to refine that feedback into a final release that they're going to be very happy with. So let me back out of slides for a moment and switch over to my demo machine. You'll see me back, uh, switching back and forth a few times here, so I'm going to spend about 80% of my time in demos today. And the first thing that I mentioned is this PowerPoint storyboarding tool. And so whenever I show this tool, a lot of people ask me, well, why are you using PowerPoint for storyboarding when Microsoft already has these other solutions like Expression Sketchflow or a lot of people use Visio to, to, to create storyboards? And the reality is that those tools are great 
if you know how to use them. But oftentimes, you'll find yourself engaging with stakeholders who don't necessarily have the skill set to open up Expression Blend and make changes to a Sketchflow prototype and send that back to you. But my mom knows how to use PowerPoint. So pretty much everybody that you engage with in the business world uh, knows how to use PowerPoint to some degree. And so I can come in here and I can you know, put this on a screen in front of all of you and kind of communicate what I think you're asking me to build. And one of the nice things about PowerPoint, of course, is that it already has a lot of these mechanisms built into it for doing things like animations and shapes and master pages and that kind of view. So if I want to get in here and create a new slide, for example, it's just a matter of inserting a new slide. I've already created some layouts that I can just inherit from. So I have one for SharePoint. I have one for my Fabricam site. Sometimes you're modeling a brownfield application, so I might just come down into my existing application and center that the way that I'd like it, and then use the screenshot tool just to grab a screen clipping. And there's nothing fancy here. It's not rocket science. It's really easy for me to get in here and uh, quickly import some shapes. So you see I have this rich shape library. So I can grab a button. You'll notice here that this shape library has everything that you'll expect from you know, Windows Metro style applications, Windows phone applications, web, WinForms. Uh, we also open this up to the community as well. So the Visual Studio Gallery is starting to get contributions from people all over. I expect soon we'll have a rich set of shapes for iPad, for Android. Uh, you you can even go build some shapes for Commodore 64 if you're still building for that. So uh, knock yourself out. So I can come in here and I can say things like, uh, you know, create new. And then maybe I want to take some time and stylize this exactly the way I want it. So we'll just give it a nice little fill color. Uh, and let's say that you took the time to set the font and everything exactly the way that your corporate UI standards dictate. You can then take this and you can just go to storyboarding and then add this to your shapes. And this can become a Fabricam button that you can use over and over again. So again, really simple. I can export my shapes. I can share these with others. They can import them. And we can quickly iterate. And so this is a great tool that you can use just to quickly get in here and model the application and make sure you understand what they're asking for before you start writing the code. Now, once we agree with the stakeholders that that's what we want to build, then the next thing to do is to make sure that we represent that somewhere as work that we're going to build. And so this is our new Team Foundation Server web access. And so you'll notice here that I have a really nice Metro-style UI over on the left-hand side. So all of those tiles update as I'm looking at this page on a regular basis. I can customize what those tiles point to. So I can say uh, that that's the branch I care about, is that Fabricam Fiber Dev. Um, I'm, I care about the bugs and I care about feedback. And so I'll show you some more of those capabilities later. But this is my personal view. The other thing that we've added to Team Foundation Server is the concept of having individual small working teams. And so you, you see here on the right-hand side that I have four people on my team, and this is our working set. We may have thousands of people that, that access this Team Foundation Server on a weekly basis, but you don't work with thousands of people on a daily basis. So this is the one place that you can come create your own portal, and then that way you can track the things that are, that are immediately relevant to your team. And so the next thing that I might do is come into this backlog and capture some new work that's coming in. So um, as an admin, I need to edit employees. And when I press enter, that just gets saved straight back to Team Foundation Server. I can also do things like turn on forecast lines. So because we have these effort estimates down here, we also have this velocity that we're using to estimate how much work we can get done on a per sprint basis. And so if I hire more people or you know, buy more beer and pizza for the team, maybe they can get more done. And so now I can communicate again with my stakeholder and say, based on this prioritization, based on the amount of money you're giving me to go hire great talent, this is when you can expect features to be done. And they may say, well, you know what? This uh, you know, submitting invoices, I see it's a big work item. We might be able to get more work done if we reprioritize that. So as I drag items up and down the backlog, they're just going to make those changes in the background for me automatically in Team Foundation Server. Now, of course, this is going to be a high priority item, so I'll do what you're never supposed to do, which is add this to an in-flight sprint. And we'll come back to this sprint now and take a look at how the individual product backlog items now break down into the individual tasks that are required to go do this work. And so the first thing that I'll do is I'll just break down this new requirement into two capabilities. One is design the UI, 
And we'll ask Annie to do that. Let's say it will take her four hours. And the next is just to implement the UI. And we'll ask Cameron to do that. And let's say it takes him six hours. And right away, I see that I've now pushed my team over capacity. So my team's not happy about this. We don't want to burn out the team. We need to make some other adjustments here. And so what I'll do is I'll just scroll down and take a look at this uh, lower priority work item, and we'll just move that forward to Sprint 4. So that's just a quick adjustment that we made. Notice here that we can set capacity on a per team member basis. So maybe Annie is a shared resource. We get her for three hours a day on this particular project. She might also participate in other projects as well. It could be that for this particular sprint, we get her for three hours. For the next sprint, when we're really locking down and finalizing the UI, we get her for six hours. So you have a lot of flexibility in how you model this. If somebody was to, to uh, you know, be out of the office for, for any reason, you could go reflect that in here and say they're out sick, and you can see the effect that that has on your schedule in real time and make the necessary adjustments. So that's kind of the agile planning portion of some of the tools we're giving you. And like I said, if you're practicing Scrum, that's going to be immediately familiar to you. And if you're not, these tools will still work regardless of the process template that you use within Team Foundation Server. So now that I'm happy with this work, let me switch over to my modern day implementation of post-it notes on a whiteboard where I can actually track this work as it moves through the system. One of the nice things about this is it's all touch enabled. I don't have a touch screen monitor, but if you did, you could put this up in a team room somewhere and then people, when they're on their way to the break room, they can just say, you know what, I completed a few hours against this. They can just tap and go and say, update that in real time, just makes it really easy for you to keep your tasks up to date and you can tell at a glance where people are at with respect to the work that's remaining. So as that work gets done, I can drag this over, it automatically zeroes it out. The other thing that you'll notice down here is that I can, for example, sort by an individual. So this is nice when you go to your stand-up meetings and you need to be able to say, this is what I did yesterday, here's what I'm working on today, here's my impediments, that sort of thing. And then you can also change the view as well to see a team member view. So for example, if I knew that Cameron was going to be out of the office, I might want to take this work and just reassign it to somebody else. So that's just a quick look at the agile planning and tracking capabilities. And then the other thing that I mentioned is that we want to really circle back with the stakeholders to say, we built something. We're kind of mid-flight in this iteration. We would love for you to take a look at it and tell us whether or not it meets your expectations. Because at this point, we still have some time to change it before that final delivery. Now think about that for a second. Think about the stakeholders that you interact with, whether they're end users, whether it's your vice president, whether it's a lawyer who needs to make sure that the UI meets accessibility requirements and so on. Think about all the people that you need to get feedback from while you're building your application. And think about today how you might get feedback from them. You know, if I just wanted to ask the front row of people up here to give me feedback on my application, we can go, you know, at lunch and sit down and look at the app and they can give me their feedback and I can take some notes. If I want to ask everybody in this room to give me feedback, that becomes really untenable. You're all going to email me or catch me in the hallway. It's tough for me to capture those conversations. And especially once I go back to Redmond next week, I can't just sit with you and watch over your shoulder and experience through your eyes as you're using the application. And so to help solve that, we've actually built a new feedback collection tool directly into Team Foundation Server. So if I come back to Web Access here, one of the things I can do is say request feedback, and I'm going to ask for some feedback from, from Cameron. And at this point, I'm going to say where the application is that I'm getting feedback on. So this could be a staging server somewhere, so I'll just say staging.fabricam. Dot com. I could tell him the credentials to log in, anything he needs to know to get that application installed so that he can start giving feedback. And then finally, does the employee page provide the right level of functionality? Whatever I want to ask him at that point. This is going to generate an email that now goes to Cameron, and when he's ready to give feedback, he can follow this link and give me feedback. So if we now switch over to Cameron's view. He'll see an email that looks something like this. And then when he's ready, he can say start feedback session, and this launches a new tool called the Microsoft Feedback Client. The great thing about this tool is it's completely free. 
Your users don't even need to have a Team Foundation Server client access license in order to use this tool. In fact, if you notice here, the install the feedback tool link just goes to Microsoft.com. So if they haven't run this tool for the first time, they can install that and they're up and running. And this email that I just sent to the user already contains all the information about the Team Foundation Server URL, the project, the work item that I'm asking for. So your users don't even need to know what a work item is at the end of the day. All they need to know is that you're asking asking for feedback and the tool will do the rest. And so at this point, it's telling me how to open up that website. And once I get the website ready, then I can just say next and start collecting information about my session. Now there's a few different ways that your users can give feedback at this point. The first thing they can do is just start typing notes into this form field. So, you know, love the new UI, that's great. The other thing they can do, though, is they can turn on screen capture, and they can capture a video recording as they're using the, the application. They can turn on a microphone as well, so they don't have to actually sit there and type. Maybe you're a very busy executive, you don't have time to take all these notes, but you just want to use the application and kind of share your feedback. The other thing they can do is grab screenshots. So here, we're asking the user, does the employee page provide the right functionality? And when we go over to the employee page and take a look at this, you know, that looks pretty good. But one of the things that Cameron really wants is he wants us to add, I don't know, maybe a, a, an employee ID column. And so he's going to grab that screenshot there. If I double click, I can then annotate that screenshot. So we can come in here and say, you know, I'd like this to have an employee ID column. We can leave that note. And then I can give the scenario an overall rating. We can say next, submit that. That automatically goes into Team Foundation Server. And at that point, your stakeholder is done. They don't need to do anything else. They're, they're back to whatever they were working on. But now when I come back over to my session here, maybe as the product owner, and I refresh this view, you may have noticed that the feedback was incremented. And when I open up that feedback, you'll notice that I have a new feedback response. And there's everything I need to make this actionable. So I could now create a new work item. Maybe it's a new requirement. Maybe this is a bug. I can create a new bug. And when I do that, I can link that back to the original feedback request so that the developer who picks up this work can immediately understand in the stakeholder's own words exactly what they're asking for. So it kind of eliminates this potential for disconnect. And let me tell you, there's no better way to get a bug fixed than have your vice president leaving you feedback, especially with an audio recording, cursing at your application until you get it fixed. The other nice thing about this is that in certain industries, you have to have a certain number of stakeholders actually sign off on a particular requirement before you push that into production. And so because all of this is now stored as a work item within Team Foundation Server, it's very easy for me to write a query and say, hey, for these acceptance tests, do we have you know, at least four people that have signed off on it with a rating of four or higher? So there's all sorts of really interesting scenarios that you can start to enable with that. So those are a few of the ways that we're improving stakeholder integration. The next thing that I want to talk about, of course, is what's probably most interesting to the majority of this room, and that is just developer-focused productivity. And so what I'm going to focus on are a few things. Number one, we want to help you improve your quality. Visual Studio has always been about helping you write code quickly and helping you write high-quality code. And so we've got a number of tools in here now that I'll show you that can really help you improve that. Things like unit testing and code clone analysis. We also want to make sure that you can stay on task and in the zone when you're working. And we know that as you start moving to more of an agile world, you get more and more interruptions. What you were working on this morning may no longer be a priority for you if there's a production fire drill that you need to go fix a bug for. Or maybe the requirement that the customer asked for last week is no longer the most important requirement because they're tr trying to, to respond to some sort of competitive situation. Now, we want to be able to respond as developers, but being able to get back in and out of the zone is a really tricky challenge because you've got files open, breakpoints, uh, you, you're working in different branches, and so we're doing a lot of work in the product to help alleviate those problems. Let me switch back over and show you the first of these, which is the new suspend and resume capability. 
This is a common scenario, right? I'm in the middle of editing some files. I have some breakpoints set. If I had multiple monitors, I might have my debug windows open on one monitor and my code editor open up on another monitor. And what you'll notice over here, for those of you that already use Team Foundation Server, is we've actually revamped the Team Explorer over here. So I can still access my builds, my reports, my documents, my work items, but you'll also notice this new My Work category as well. And when I switch to my work, this is a personalized view that shows you as a developer the work items that are currently assigned to you, any code reviews that we'll get into later, and also any work that's in progress. So notice up here, if I zoom in a little bit, Notice that we have some in-progress work. We're designing the implementation of a feature. We've got some files we're editing. We've got breakpoints. And now we get interrupted. So at this point, what I'd like to do is go ahead and suspend this work. And we, when we suspend this, it's going to back up all of my changes to Team Foundation Server. So if I lose my laptop later, I can always go back and see the file edits that I was making. But the other thing that it's doing is it's taking note of my entire environment so that when I go fix the bug or work on whatever feature I've been asked to work on, when I'm ready to come back to this original work, all I need to do is say resume. That's going to automatically rehydrate the state of my environment and put me right back into the zone where I can be productive. Okay. Now, let me show you a couple of other new things we've done. Let me just clean up my environment really fast here. One of the things that, uh, that I really like about the new Solution Explorer, by the way, how many people have tried Visual Studio 2012? RCs, betas? Okay, fantastic. So you may have noticed this already. One of the things that we've done here is we've actually merged the class view and the Solution Explorer. So we still have a dedicated class view, but one of the really nice things I can do here is actually start to expand and you'll start to see that this is my CS file, this is my class, these are all of my, my uh, properties and methods and so on. So that's really nice. It puts it right, right there for me. But at this point, once Solution Explorer starts to expand, it can become a little bit overwhelming to understand, okay, what files am I actually working on right now? And one of the things you can do is you can actually filter Solution Explorer just based on pending changes. And so now notice how I turn that on and off. It, sh it shows me exactly where my pending changes are. There's another filter on here, which is just your open files, which in this case would be the same. Uh, but that's just a really nice way for you to, again, get in and out of what you were working on. Another thing we can do now is we can also generate a dependency graph straight from this class, for example. The other thing that you may notice here if you've done the dependency graph generation in years past is that the dependency graph generation is actually a modal dialog. Now it's no longer a modal dialog. So I can continue working while it's building that dependency graph. And once it's done, it'll just come back to me and that file is ready for me to work with. So just a lot of really nice fit and finish things there. Another thing that we've done is we've made it really easy for you to, uh, to work offline or to work on files that are version controlled, but work on them outside of Visual Studio. And what I mean by that is traditionally, with Visual Studio 2010 and TFS 2010, for example, if I went to Explore and I started to edit these files, so let's say that you know, I make an edit here, hello, TechEd, what would happen if I hit Save at this point with 2010? Read only, exactly. It's, it's annoying, right? And then you have to go check out, and it's a big problem, right? Now when I save that file, it just saves, and uh, I can even create a new file in the background. So let's say, I don't know, we'll create a new uh, text file, Amsterdam. And now when I come back over to pending changes, we actually have the file watcher turned on in the background, and it automatically picked up the readme file changed. The other thing that it did is it picked up this new file. Now, we don't automatically add that to your pending changes because we don't want to accidentally add or remove files. So any new files or deleted files, you'll just come into detected changes, and then you can promote those, and then those are part of your change set. So we'll just go ahead and promote that, and at this point, we'll go ahead and check in those changes. So those are just a few of the ways that we're making you more productive. Uh, we have some other sessions this week. I'll just give you kind of a roadmap as we go. So you might want to take some notes as you go if there's anything that's interesting. One session I forgot to mention, if you're interested more in those Agile tools, we have a session called Deep Dive with the Agile Planning Tools. That's Dev217. 
And so, so they'll, they'll be going much deeper into the agile planning and tracking tools and showing you how you can map those into your own custom process templates. So that's Dev 217. If you're interested in more of the developer collaboration and productivity capabilities, definitely check out Dev 344. That's Dev 344. So that's developer collaboration with Team Foundation Server 2012. Let, let me now switch gears and show you what the code review experience looks like. First of all, I'm going to do a work item search right within Team Explorer. A lot of people have asked for that, so we've now built that into Team Explorer. And I can find this work. I know that Annie is actually out today, so I'll just reassign this to myself. And then I'll switch back over to my work. And I'll just say, you know, this work on Canadian addresses, I'm going to start that. So now I'm going to set that to be in progress so people will see that it's in progress if other people on my team take a look at that. And then I know that for that particular work, what I need to do is actually come into this uh, file in here. And what we're doing is we're basically fixing up the, the uh, regular expressions so that it's not just focused on U.S. zip codes, but we also want to um, honor Canadian postal codes as well. So I think that's the right re regular expression. I found it online, but I'd really like to have somebody else on my team take a look at that. And so now what we've done is we've built code review uh, right into right into Team Foundation server. So what I can do is I can ask Cameron, and maybe we'll ask Annie to take a look at this. Uh, I can say, you know, does this regex look right to you? And I can go ahead and submit that request. It's going to save my changes and push those over to Cameron. And so then once again, if I come back over to Cameron, one of the things you'll notice about Cameron is he really likes the dark UI within Visual Studio 2012. So you could turn that on if you want. I know that's becoming quite popular back in Redmond. And then when he comes to his My Work view, he'll see down here at the bottom that he has this code review request from me. One of the really nice things about this workflow is that everything's in the same place. So I don't have to go knock on Cameron's office and say, you know, hey, I really need you to take a look at this file before I check it in. I don't have to send him an email. Everybody can sit right within their My Work view, and they can see things as they flow through the system. So one of the things you'll notice here in the code review is that I have the option to either accept or decline this code, re code review request. Say that ten, 10 times fast. Um, you don't have to do this, but one of the times that it's really nice to say that you're going to work on this code review is if you have a, a much more complex code review and there may be other people on your team who have also been asked to look at this code review. So I can just say accept, and that signals to Annie, for example, that I'm looking at this and maybe she doesn't have to. So I'll go ahead and say accept. And then if I come down to this address file, you'll notice that uh, for the first time in like you know, 10 years, we've actually invested in the UI for doing a diff between two files. So that's really nice. And uh, I can also scroll between these files at the same time. So it's really easy for me to spot the difference between those two files. The other thing to point out is kind of a small feature across Visual Studio, but notice this tab up here. You'll notice in Visual Studio 2012 that by default, a lot of the files that you'll open when you're doing code reviews or debugging actually appear as this provisional tab in the upper right-hand corner. And the nice thing about that provisional tab is that once I'm done with this code review or once I'm done with the debugging session, it's going to go away automatically. It's going to clean up my environment. So that's really nice, especially when you're like stepping in, stepping over, stepping in. Pretty soon you've got like 40 files open in a debug session. So by default, those are going to open up in that provisional tab. If I want, I can click to upgrade that to a full tab. But by default, I just want to make this go away once I'm done with the code review. So at this point, uh, you know, maybe this looks pretty good. I might uh, suggest that since we're going to be more geographically correct, uh, we want to rename this to postal code. So notice I'm leaving a comment on that specific line. And then once I'm ready, I can go ahead and say send and finish. And that closes the code review. And again, it puts Cameron back to where he needs to be in order to do his job. So now if I switch back over to my own view and I refresh this, you probably can't tell, but it's actually bold down here, indicating that it's changed since the last time I've looked at it. And so I now have these comments back from Cameron, which is nice. And so I, I see that you know he's approved it. He's left uh, this comment, so maybe I'll deal with that refactoring later. Um, one of the things I can do is I can tell Annie, you know, Cameron already looked at this. So now she knows that she doesn't have to take a look at this. And then once I'm ready, I can go ahead and check this in. 
And so I'm, I'll go ahead and close this code review. And I'll check in that file. Fixed Canada. <laughs> okay. Now, the next thing at this point that I, I want to show off is actually a feature from Visual Studio 2010 and TFS 2010, but not a lot of people know about it, and that's the ability to actually do branching and merging visualization across TFS. And so what I mean by that is if I take a look at that dev branch where I just checked in that file and I view history on that, Notice that these are all the changes that I just checked in. Now let's say that it's really, really important for me to fast track that fix to the Canadian postal codes over to my production website. Obviously, we have a cadence where we're rolling out to operations every week, but marketing is telling us that we need to fast track this, you know, kind of yesterday, right? And so one of the ways I might do that is say, okay, well, I, I checked this into my dev branch, but how do I get this to my release branch? Well, if I right click on this guy and say track change set, it's actually going to allow me to visualize across my entire branch structure, and you should see the dev div branches. I mean, we've got dozens and dozens of branches back in dev div at, at Microsoft where we actually build Visual Studio. This one's quite simple, but it illustrates the point that I can now see that that change was checked into the dev branch, and if I need to get it over to this release branch, it's going to be a matter of merging it through this integration branch first. And in order to do that, all I need to do is drag and drop it onto main. It's going to ask me, what do I want to merge? This is just your standard branching and merging dialog. I actually want to just cherry pick this individual file and merge that. And at this point, it's going to pin that change and allow me to check that in. Eventually. I promise it works. Is it a linear performance? Oh, there we go. All right. Now I don't have to answer that question. <laughs> so at this point, what I've done is I've pended that change. I can go ahead and check that in. And uh, if I rerun that visualization by coming back over here, then you'll notice that it's now in main. Now at this point, let's say that you're the release manager and you're, and you're trying to understand for that particular code change that just came into main that you're being asked to merge into the release branch. Has that gone through a code review? Have we actually made sure that a senior dev has taken a look at that? One of the really nice things about this model is now when I look at history for this particular hierarchy and I look at this change set details, I'll notice that this is the file that's being merged this address.cs file, and I can right click and I can say annotate this file, and I'll notice that for that particular change, we can see exactly what line of code was changed in that particular change set at the origin. So not at the point of merge, but at the origin, because that's the most important part. That's where we actually made the bug fix. And so if I open up that change set, you'll notice that that particular code review is also tracked in there, and I can go all the way back and say, okay, for this particular line of code, was it code reviewed? Yes, it was code reviewed by Cameron. He signed off on it. Now I feel comfortable about pushing this out to production after I've done appropriate testing and all that good stuff. So that's just a really nice way that we've incorporated code review right into Team Foundation Server so that you can get that full end-to-end -end traceability later on when you need to run those audits, as opposed to maybe emailing files back and forth or having you know, these hallway code review conversations or that sort of thing. Okay, next thing I'll show you is the new unit testing capability that we have. Um, how many people use in-unit? Yeah, fair number of you. How many people use kind of the built-in unit testing framework that we have within Visual Studio have for the last few years? Um, any X-unit folks out there? X-unit? 
Okay, so as you can see, we're kind of all over the map in terms of unit testing frameworks. And so one of the things that we really wanted to do within Visual Studio 2012 is make sure that we provide first class support for your unit testing framework, regardless of what you're bringing to the table. And the other thing that we've noticed too is that you maybe are using you know, MS test for most of your tests, but then you'll find an open source library that already has a bunch of tests written in InUnit that you then want to use as part of your project. Wouldn't it be nice if you could just run all those tests as part of the same solution? And now you can. What we've done is we've actually recreated the unit testing framework within Visual Studio, and we've done so with an extensible set of unit testing adapters. By default, we'll ship the traditional Visual Studio unit testing framework. We have a brand new unit testing framework for C++ developers as well, so you can write unit tests in C++ if you want to. And then you can also install free third-party adapters from, from this, the same folks that make uh, InUnit and XUnit. There's also a lot of JavaScript unit testing frameworks uh, that are starting to be, re be released for Visual Studio 2012 as well. And so what we do is we just scan across your entire solution looking for unit tests that are in your solution that match the type of adapter you have installed. For this particular project, I have some unit tests that were created using XUnit, some that were created using the traditional Visual Studio unit testing framework. So if I take a look at this particular test, for example, you'll notice that this is an XUnit test. And then I have some other tests down here that are the more traditional Visual Studio unit tests. So now they all just sit in the same uh, system. You can also install those same adapters on your build server as well. So you can make sure that everything gets built and uh, regardless of the type of unit tests, everything is checking out and is exactly as it should be. If you're interested in unit testing, my friend Peter Provost is going to go very deep this week into unit testing. He has a session called Dev214, which is the introductory session for unit testing. And then for those of you that need to do things like you know, creating mocking objects and that sort of thing, we have a new uh, framework in Visual Studio called Microsoft Fakes. And Microsoft Fakes allows you to not only do uh, mocking type testing, but it also allows you to test untestable code. Like how do, you, how do you test where you're actually swapping out the system's date and time? And so Peter will show you some really cool capabilities now uh, that you can do just that with. And so that is session uh, Dev 411. That's testing untestable code with fakes. Now, can anyone tell me what the most popular code, re code reuse pattern in the world is? Copy and paste, absolutely. Copy and paste, we've all done it. Not me, but you know, most of us have done it, right? Now I've done it as well. And so it's a, it's a common habit, right? We see something we like in, in one you know, class over here, so we copy it and we paste it over there and we change just the few lines of code that we need and we promise ourselves we'll go back and refactor this properly later on and that never happens. Um, but eventually we'd like to go back and look for those code clones and that can become a really difficult job because we don't necessarily re remember what we copied and pasted. And so one of the tools that we've built right into Visual Studio now came straight from Microsoft Research and it's called code clone analysis. What I can do with code clone analysis is actually look across my entire solution for granular blocks of code which look to be similar. They don't have to be identical. You can even be, as I'll show you in a, in a moment, you can even have different classes that maybe in, inherit from the same base class um, that show up on our radar as a strong or a medium strong match. And so here you can see when I ran across my entire solution, I actually found two files here that, that look pretty similar. One, is, one of these is the service tickets controller.cs. And I have this other file called service tickets controller.cs as well, which is showing up as a code clone. Now, I'm a little bit curious why I'm getting two files that are called service ticket controller. Well, one of the things that we've done here, let me remove my filter. One of the things we've done in the Solution Explorer, again, is allowed you to sync directly with Solution Explorer to see the file you have open. So what I did is I opened this file, I clicked on sync. It shows me here that this is in the fabricamfiber.web project. If I now go back to the other file and I sync, you'll see that that's in fabricamfiber.extranet.web. So that's starting to tell me the story, right? What someone probably did is they said, hey, this class we have over here, it's got exactly what I need. Let me paste it into this other project. And then if I look at these two files side by side, you should be able to spot the difference. So if I compare these files, 
then you'll notice that what they did is they just took some code, they changed the last line for the redirect action, and then they called it a day. So what I'd really like to do is just refactor this code later on, maybe pass that in as an argument for the redirect option, and that'll make my maintenance of this solution much easier moving forward. So that's code clone analysis. Now, there's another way to run code clone analysis that uh, you can use on a much more granular basis. So what I just did right there was actually look across the entire solution for any large blocks of code that match uh, other large blocks of code within the solution. But sometimes you might be looking at a couple of lines like this and you might say, you know, um, I'm starting to work with this customer repository object for the first time. One of the questions I might have is when other people use this object, do they wrap this in a try-catch block? Um, you know, before they do a save operation. And so I can just right click on this now and I can say find matching clones specifically for those two lines and it's going to come back with a bunch of hits for me as well. And so what you'll notice down here is that we have this uh, customer's controller class. So this is a customer repository, an employee's controller. So that's the employee repository. So again, regardless of whether or not you have files that have the same variable name and, and whether or not you're inheriting from different base classes and that sort of thing, uh, the code clone analysis is, is, is pretty smart about being able to find these potential matching clones uh, to help you, number one, do, that, do those refactorings, and number two, kind of look across your solution and say, hey, where else am I using this, uh, this pattern so I can see whether or not other people on my team um, are, are, are following certain conventions for it. So that's code clone analysis. Okay. So let me switch gears one more time talk about the operations side of the house. Now, now, I polled the audience earlier. I know that not a lot of people of you are from the operations side of the house, uh, but occasionally you probably receive bugs from the operational side of the house, and there's a lot of challenges uh, when it comes to dealing with bugs that come from production. Number one, it, it can oftentimes be very difficult to actually reproduce problems that you have in a production environment. Uh, it could be a problem that only happens once a month at the end of the month when you're running a payroll processing job. And so that's something that's very difficult for you to simulate in a dev and test environment. The other problem is that you can't just attach a debugger to a running process on a production machine. Or, or if you can, you might want to evaluate that policy. Um, but we want to be able to give you some of the same tools that you use in your dev and test environment to be able to use that in a production environment as well. And so how many of, of you have used uh, IntelliTrace from Visual Studio 2010 or are roughly familiar with it? Okay, so if, you, if you're not familiar with IntelliTrace, I would encourage you uh, to check that out. Basically, IntelliTrace runs on your .NET application and gives you a historical stack trace over time. It's kind of like a VCR for your code. And so if you're too young to know what a VCR is, ask the person next to you. They can explain it to you later. But the idea is that with a VCR, of course, you can go back in time and you can say, all right, I I see what I have over here. Let me go back in time and understand why am I throwing that exception? Oh, it's because I didn't read and initialize that value from this database because I didn't have permissions or something like that. And so IntelliTrace is a really powerful tool. One of the things that we're doing now is we're actually extending that so you can use IntelliTrace in a production environment. And you can do so for free. What that means is you can even redistribute IntelliTrace with your applications your operations folks can be trained on how to turn that on and off and how to collect the appropriate data. And then when they have a production system problem, they can turn that on, they can capture the data that you need, and then they can send that back over to you in the dev environment so that you can step back in time and see exactly what that looks like. And so to simulate that, let's say that this is a, an application that we have which is uh, running in production. And notice we're starting to get some intermittent errors over here. And you'll notice that you know, most of these records look fine, but occasionally I click on an error and, or I click on a record and it throws this error. Well, I did the right thing in my code. I'm throwing a custom you know, ASP.NET error message. I'm not just dropping you to the yellow screen of, of exceptions. But what that means is I don't really have any more insights at this point into what's actually happening within my application. And again, this is in my production data center, so I can't just attach a debugger. But one of the things I might do is I might ask my operations folks to 
use the new IntelliTrace in production PowerShell files that we have. And what I've done, I've actually captured this in advance just to save us some time. But what I've done is I've actually started collecting IntelliTrace information against that particular application pool. It resets the application pool, and then what it does is it rejets all of the .NET binaries so that it's instrumenting those with interesting trace points that we might be interested in. So every time we call a method or every time we access the registry or the file system or throw or catch an exception, we want to actually log that for us, and that's going to go into a file that we can then copy back onto a USB key if we're, if we're disconnected between the two dev and production environments then load that up in Visual Studio and see exactly what's going on. So if I now take a look at this IntelliTrace file that I collected, I'm just going to open this up in Visual Studio, clear up some real estate here. And uh, Jason showed, showed this a little bit this morning. You'll notice I have a list of all of my exceptions that are taking place. And I can just double click on one of those exceptions. And when I start debugging here, it's actually going to look like we're F5 debugging the application. But remember, this is a different machine. So we're running in a different environment. Basically, what it's doing is it's showing us backwards in time exactly what's happening here. Notice on the right-hand side, we have a list of all, all of our IntelliTrace events. So this is every time we're accessing ADO.NET, for example. Um, and if I mouse over that, you'll actually see the exact call that's going out in ADO.NET. So now I can see uh, maybe it's a malforms query or something that uh, isn't selecting the right rows that I need. Makes it really easy for me to get in and, and troubleshoot the application tier talking to the data tier. Um, notice it took me straight to the line of code that threw the exception. Um, I can also turn on locals variables here. So I can see exactly which, um, which members of this particular property were maybe set to a null reference. And so it makes it really easy for me to get in here. And then if I wanted to, I could go back in time and say, why did I get here? Oh, it's because I threw this exception 10, 10 call frames earlier. The other nice thing about IntelliTrace that I found is that even if you're not seeing a, a customer visible problem on your production website, one of the, the, the downsides and upsides about modern application frameworks is that they're trained to kind of catch a lot of exceptions so that we don't bring down the application. But there could be some things that are happening in the background that you actually really care about. Like let's say that you're a bank and you have an, an auditing trail that's turned on. And for some reason, the database that's supposed to capture that audit trail filled up. So you're getting all these exceptions. Customers can still you know, check out money and, or, or you know, deposit and withdraw funds, but you don't have this audit trail that you might need to go back to later on. What I suggest is sometimes you can just turn on IntelliTrace on that particular system and come in and look and see whether or not you're throwing and catching any exceptions. And that could sh show a problem that you didn't even know that you had. So, so that's IntelliTrace in production. And again, it's, it's kind of a, a powerful tool uh, to help you get in there and troubleshoot. So there's a few things that I didn't have time to show you today. Uh, so we'll just go round robin here. Of course, I showed you PowerPoint storyboarding. I showed you the agile planning and tracking tools. Um, we showed a lot of what's down here. One of the things that I didn't show you is exploratory testing. So for those of you that raised your hands earlier and said that you're testers, um, I have another session tomorrow morning where I'm going to be going end to end across our Microsoft Test Manager 2012 product, as well as our lab management product. So if you're a tester, that gives you a great environment to go in and conduct your manual tests and be able to report those on the, st on the status of your test runs back to the development team and to do so in a rich, actionable way so that we're capturing things in the background that can help the developer not only reproduce the issue but understand and troubleshoot and ultimately fix what's going on there. The lab management capabilities that we've enhanced in this release allow you to set up a virtual environment or a physical environment in a matter of minutes now. So in the past, in 2010, you would have had to use System Center Virtual Machine Manager. It would have taken you at least a weekend just to set up a, a, a Hello World environment. Now what I'll show tomorrow morning is actually setting up a very similar environment, uh, but in a matter of minutes. And that's something that's not only helpful for testers, but it's also helpful for developers as well. Let's say that I'm, I'm doing all my day-to-day -day development on my brand new Windows 8 development workstation, but I need to make sure that my code actually runs and compiles and unit tests pass correctly over on a Windows server environment. Now what you can do is you can spin up a lab managed environment that that machine could be running on Hyper-V, it could be running on VirtualBox, VMware, it could be a physical box that you have sitting under your desk, and you can just let that participate in a really nice build, deploy, test workflow so that you can make a change, check that into TFS, 
It can build, automatically compile, push over to Windows Server, and in a few minutes you can find out if you have a problem over there. So that, that again, is my software testing talk tomorrow morning. Another thing that I, uh, that I wanted to mention is we, we did show this morning the SCOM integration that you have between System Center Operations Manager and Team Foundation Server. And so if you're using System Center Operations Manager within your, your environments to monitor your production servers, one of the really nice things you can do now is, is as Jason showed, you can have an alert in SCOM and you can say, this is an alert that my application team needs to take a look at. You can right click, assign that to engineering, and that can automatically include all the information that System Center knows about the problem. That could be you know, basic information like what server was it on, what operating system, what service pack level, how much memory was available, um, as well as really deep diagnostics information uh, similar to the IntelliTrace debugging that I showed you earlier. So if you're using System Center, definitely wire that up. System Center Operations Manager 2020. 12 out of the box supports integration with TFS 2010 and later on when System Center Operations Manager 2012 Service Pack 1, say that 10 times fast, ships, then you'll be able to wire up with TFS 2012 as well. Finally, we've partnered with our friends at Preemptive. You may know Preemptive, they make a really nice uh, obfuscation product called Dotfuscator. They also have this product called Preemptive Analytics as well. And preemptive analytics is a really nice capability that allows you to get some of the same type of functionality that Microsoft has been using for the last 15, 20 years to capture really rich analytics information directly from our end users. So every time you say send a Watson error report and that goes back to Microsoft, that gives us really valuable data that we look at in terms of trying to make sure that we're fixing bugs moving forward. The other thing you may notice is, is that if you install products like Visual Studio, SQL Server, Zune, Office, a lot of these products ask you to participate in the customer experience program. And when you're opting into that, what that does is it sends anonymous aggregate data back to Microsoft so that when we're making product decisions about what features to invest in, we can run reports and say, well, for the last version of Excel, how many people actually use this formula? And that's data that you can now get for your own applications as well by taking advantage of preemptive analytics. And so with preemptive analytics, you can basically instrument your application to either capture things like exceptions that are occurring out in the wild. So let's say you have a Windows Phone app that you published and it's throwing exceptions. How do you get that information back? You can now get that back with preemptive analytics. It goes straight into TFS. And they also have a version that they sell that allows you to get all these feature-specific uh, capabilities as well. So you can now start to say how many people use this feature versus that feature and segment it by user and country and so on. And so if that's interesting to you, I would encourage you to take a look at Dev321. So that's continuous feedback in Agile Teams, Dev321. And then uh, I forgot to mention the, the other IntelliTrace session, which is Dev390. So that'll give you a full in-depth look at IntelliTrace. So a few call to actions for you. Uh, the first is to go download the release candidate if you haven't already. One really nice thing about the release candidate for Visual Studio 2012 as well as TFS and .NET Framework 4.5 is that it does have a go live license. What that means is you can start using it on your machines in production today and we'll support you when you upgrade from RC to RTM. In fact, with Visual Studio and TFS, if you go from RC to RTM, it's a really smooth upgrade story. All you'll need to do is run setup, and it should automatically upgrade and preserve all of your settings. Another thing that you can do for those of you that are kind of braving Visual Studio 2012, but you have other team members who aren't quite ready to, to move over, is so we actually have bi-directional solution and project compatibility for most scenarios between Visual Studio 2010 SP1 and Visual Studio 2012. What that means is if you open up a solution that your colleagues are using Visual Studio 2010 SP1 with and you save it, they'll continue to be able to open that solution and vice versa. So it allows you to ease into the release. Um, everything that I showed you today is actually downloadable in this virtual machine as well. So I ship all of my virtual machines for you. I have 18 hands-on labs and demo scripts that you can go back and play with if you want to get a little bit hands-on, deeper uh, uh, sense for some of these capabilities. And so that's the URL, aka.ms slash vs11almvm. I know it's another long one. But if you find me during the week, I also have uh, USB drives. I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to let you copy uh, to your laptops as well. 
Another thing that you may have noticed a couple of weeks ago, um, is anybody in here using the TFS preview, the hosted version of Team Foundation Server? Great. So um, we've had the hosted version of Team Foundation Server called the Team Foundation Service uh, up for a little over a year now. It's hosted on the Windows Azure platform. And during that year, we've had a lot of customers around the globe use that in a production environment, meaning that that's their day-to-day -day source control, work item tracking, you name it. And um, we we allowed them to invite friends by sharing an invite code with other friends, and then they could get a new invite code and kind of share it with other people as well during this limited preview. Now, what uh, we've done is we've opened it up. So if you go to tfspreview.com, you can actually sign up uh, for your own account without having one of these invite codes. So we're, what we're saying is you can use TFS Preview without actually having any friends, which is really nice. Um, and uh, for now, during the preview, you can actually use that for free. We haven't announced final uh, pricing or uh, timing for the official release, but what marketing has committed to is that there will continue to be a free version of this as well. So they haven't quite figured out the, uh, the feature differentiation. There's going to be a free and a paid version, uh, but we're really excited to be able to make this available to you so that you can use TFS from anywhere in the world. I'll leave these slides in here as well um, that, that uh, you can download. So there's a lot of other ALM content that I didn't even talk to. Uh, a few that I would like to mention, if you're just getting started with TFS, be sure to check out one of the following sessions. My friend Martin Woodward is giving a session on the hosted Team Foundation service. And so he'll show you how to get started, how to sign up for your account. And by the end of the session, he actually has continuous build working within the Team Foundation service so that you can actually build your projects and everything just pushes out to Windows Azure. It's really nice. Um, I'll go back through these a couple times. I know a few of you are still jotting down some notes here. The other thing that you can do is you can now take advantage of the new Team Foundation server 2012 Express product. So that's a new free product that you can use for up to five people on a team that need to access Team Foundation Server 2012. Um, it contains most of the capabilities that the full-fledged version of Team Foundation Server does. And that's uh, Dev 346. So that's all aboard the Team Foundation Server Express. And then there's one session that, unfortunately, we're unable to make happen for Europe. But if you are responsible for managing Team Foundation Server in a large enterprise, um, you should go back to the North America content from two weeks ago and look for a session by my friend Jeff Levinson. He's responsible for maintaining the Team Foundation Server instance at Boeing. So they have several thousand people within Boeing who use Team Foundation Server on a regular basis. And he gave a great session. It's recorded. It's online. It's Dev 34. Three, implementing Team Foundation Server in the enterprise. So if you need to think through um, how do you roll out process templates and how do you let people kind of self-manage their projects, Jeff has a lot of great tips. You can watch that session recording uh, just by going to channel9.msdn.com. And I think uh, with that, I am just about finished. So thank you very much for spending this hour with me. And uh, we'll be around all week, so I look forward to talking to you throughout the week. Thank you very much.